We've seen a provocative example of data mining. Let's go ahead and take a more formal look at the process of data mining, as well as try to understand and learn some of the terminology that is commonly used in data mining. In data mining, there are two main kinds of things that we do. The first is simply to explore data. Now, unlike typical statistical analysis and other things where we know what we are looking for, at least we know what problem we are trying to solve, and we go ahead, look at the data and solve the problem. In data mining, quite often what happens is that we've got a large amount of data. We don't know exactly what we are going to do with that data. So we are sort of using an opportunistic approach where we look at the data, explore, examine, try to identify underlying patterns, and then get an idea of what is possible with it. So it's very opportunistic kind of an approach. And there are several things we could do with exploration. First might be to simply look at correlations. OK, you've got a bunch of variables. Let's see which variables go with which other variables. What variables seem to be connected to each other? What variables do not seem to be related at all? Things like that. We are just exploring. Uh, we've got a large amount of data. We're just going in and doing all kinds of things. So it's very opportunistic. The second kind of thing we may do again is just to visualize the data so that we are able to spot certain underlying trends. After all, when you're talking about a large amount of data, where you're talking of thousands upon thousands of rows of information, then you may not have a clear idea just by looking at the actual numbers and words what's going on. Instead, very often, our intuitions get triggered when we look at pictures. And therefore, visualization of data is something very, very important. And it's, a, it's an important step in exploratory data analysis. The third kind of thing we may do is to simply see, we've got a large amount of data. Let's take a particular variable or a set of variables. Are they all over the place? Or do they seem to be clustered in certain ways? In other words, they don't occupy the entire space but they seem to be bunched up in certain specific places. If that is the case, then that gives us a very good handle on what the data is all about. So all of these and other kinds of things are what we do when we are talking about exploratory data analysis. Typically, a data mining exercise would begin with some sort of exploration, undirected, opportunistic ex exploration, just looking at it to see what might be possible. And once you have explored the data, got some idea of the underlying patterns and so on, then we may talk about actually building models to predict various things. Now, within prediction, we may be talking about actually predicting the value of certain numerical variables, like price, cross domestic product, or we may be looking at simply classifying underlying data. So for example, you've got a lot of customers or a lot of potential customers, and you may want to look at the data and classify these customers, each individual as saying, is this person somebody who's going to buy or not? So you're just taking every record that you have, every observation that you have, and simply trying to classify it into two or more categories. Or for example, uh, a bank is thinking of giving a loan to some customer. And by looking at the demographic the information about the customer, uh, demographic and other information about the customer, they may want to make a prediction as to will this person default on the loan or will they pay up? Or uh, when let's say the IRS gets a tax return submitted by an individual, then they may want to make a determination saying, what is the probability that this tax return is actually fraudulent? Based on this, people may make all kinds of decisions. So all of these are predictive technologies or predictive techniques where we are actually trying to predict something about the future. So some of the things that we do in data mining are classification, which we've already spoken about, whether you know classifying something as normal or fraudulent, or fraudulent, or if you've got an email, this is something that our our email servers go through all the time, right? So for example, uh, Gmail or any mail server, for example, Outlook server that we have for Seton Hall, uh, when, it, when an incoming email comes in, 
the server has to make a prediction as to whether this is a spam email or a regular email. If it's a spam, of course, it's going to put it in your spam folder. So again, that is a classification. Every email is classified as spam or not. Or whether a tax return is a normal return or a fraudulent return. Or whether a particular customer is going to be a prospective customer is going to buy your product or not buy the product. They're only a prospective customer. You don't know if they, you know, they haven't yet bought. You're trying to advertise something to them, give them a promotion, but you would like to give your promotion to people who are likely to buy. So you want to classify every individual as whether the person is going to be a buyer or a non-buyer. That is called usually classification. Prediction is, of course, classification is also a prediction, but generally, when we are talking about it specifically, prediction means predicting the value of some numerical variable, say price or GDP, or what's going to be the total sales, or what's going to be our profit next year. All of these are prediction things. And then you've got another set of tools which are called association rules or affinity analysis, which essentially looks at what goes with what. That is, when people buy products, Typically, people buy products in baskets. Sometimes this is also called market basket analysis. So you may be able to say, well, people who bought this product also bought those other products. Okay. So generally, these set of products seem to go together. So if you see somebody who's bought one or more of the products, but not all of them, then now you have an opportunity to, pr to uh, promote this other product from the basket that they have not bought. Okay. So that is association rules. Now, association rules also help companies in how to lay out the store. For example, if particular products are always bought together, it might be a good idea to place them together in adjacent shelves so that people will conveniently find both of the products. If you place them far away, then it's possible they may just buy one of them and not buy the other. But given that they go together, you have a better prospect of a sale if you place them together. So association rules, analysis of association rules also has other implications rather than just selling uh, in terms of shop layout and so on. And then there are other techniques like, for example, data reduction. As I already pointed out in the last class, in data mining, very often our problem is not a paucity of data, but our problem is an abundance of data. Not a problem, but we are usually in situations where we've got an abundance of data. Now, when you have an abundance of data, you need to choose a subset of the data in such a way that it's most useful. For example, uh, you may be trying to predict something. Let's say you're trying to predict, a bank is trying to predict whether a particular customer would be a good customer to give a loan or not. And they may have hundreds and hundreds of columns of information about prospective customers or prospective loan applicants. Right. So they may have literally uh, hundreds of attributes stored about each of them. Now, they cannot try and use all of these hundreds of attributes to try and build a model because sometimes having too many variables also causes problems in your models. So in those cases, the modeler would like to select the set of variables or the set of attributes which are most useful for the modeling purpose. Okay. So even though you may have 100 attributes, you may try and say, let me select the 10 most important attributes out of these 100. And then, of course, you'll use only those 10 attributes for your model building. That process is called data reduction. Data exploration, we've already spoken about. It's just a, an opportunistic, preliminary, open-minded examination of the data to see what potential it has for patterns. And visualization also is something we've spoken about. Like I said earlier, uh, when you try to take a large data set and show it in all kinds of graphical techniques with pictures, then you may be able to see some underlying patterns. So that is also very important. One important aspect of data mining is what is called as data partitioning. Let's understand data partitioning through a good example. Let's say you're a dealer of uh, sports cars and you've got some promotional budget and you want to spend this promotional budget wisely. And what you're thinking of doing is to send a color brochure. After all, this is a sports car, so you've got to make something that looks nice and fancy. And let's say that each of your color brochures costs actually $7 to print. And of course, on top of that, you're also going to invite the people who 
uh, receive the color brochures to come test drive the vehicle and also join you for a complimentary dinner. Okay, so this is a costly proposition befitting selling of sports cars. But your budget allows you to send these invitations only to about a thousand people in a township in a certain area. And there are 30,000 non sports car owning residents in that particular town where you live or where your showroom is located in the in the adjacent area where your showroom is located so now you want to try and find out how do i select these 1000 people from among our population of 30000 people how would we go about doing this of course one opportunity one thing we could do is to just send it randomly to to households from among the 30,000. Quite quickly, of course, we realize this is not a good strategy because if you just send it randomly, you might end up sending it to people who are not at all likely customers of sports cars and then uh, you waste your money. You wasted $7 on the brochure and then some of them are going to show up, test drive your vehicle, take up your time, and then of course they're going to eat your free dinner. All this is a big waste. So you want to try and select those 1,000 people who are most likely candidates to buy your vehicles, to buy your sports cars. Now you may say, well, in this case, why don't we select the richest people, the people with the highest household incomes who don't already own a sports car? Why don't we do that? That sounds like a good idea, but that's making a big assumption that it's only people with high incomes who will buy sports cars. Well, maybe not. Maybe there are other predictors of people who buy sports cars. How do we know? There may be some very rich people who are not interested in sports cars at all. And there may be some people who really are not all that rich, but they really like sports cars. They want to buy them, own them, drive them, enjoy them, and so on. Okay, and also age may have something to do with uh, the uh, proclivity to buy sports cars. So there are all of these considerations, and we cannot just come to some random conclusions. So what we would really like to do is to carry out a data mining exercise and then figure out what is the probability for each household that they will be buyers of sports cars. Okay, so let's say that we're not going to make this decision completely in the dark. We've got historical observations from several dealerships across the country of demographic information about people who either became owners of sports cars or were not owners of sport cars, sports cars. So we've got information about 50,000 people. Based on this, we now can come to a conclusion or at least an intelligent conclusion as to what are the characteristics of people who actually go for sports cars. Here I've just shown you uh, two variables, household income and education. And for each combination, we have shown you uh, in this data, whether they own a sports car or don't own a sports car. But of course, this may, you may not have information just about those two things, household income and education. You may have information about many other characteristics as well. Okay, so we've got 50,000 50, historical observations based on which we can try to data mining and identify the underlying patterns. Right, so how might we use this to identify the 1,000 people who we want to invite as those who seem to be most likely to accept our offer. Okay, so let's see how we go about this. In traditional statistics, the problem is of data paucity. Whereas here, our, we don't have a problem with the amount of data that we have available. We've got lots of data. We've got 50,000 rows of data, 50,000 observations. We may not even have to use all of them. There's enough information to help us. Okay, so in this data set, our target variable is ownership. That is, that is what we are trying to do. We are, we are going to take future information about people, demographic information about people in this particular town that we are talking about, in that area that we are talking about. And for every person, we want to say, these are the characteristics based on our analysis this is the likelihood that this particular person will either buy the car or not buy the car, buy a sports car or not buy a sports car. Okay, so that is why we are trying to predict for each person whether they're going to be buyers or not buyers, or owners or not owners. 
okay so that is why we call that as the target variable and we want to build a model to predict the target variable based on the values of other attributes we've shown two of the attributes here but there could be many more okay so the method that we use to perform this prediction is what we call as a model in data mining now through this course we'll be learning many different types of data mining techniques and we could build a model using several of those techniques for a particular problem so in this case our problem is really one of classification we want to take every individual and classify them as either buyers or non-buyers people who will buy the sports car buy a sports car or not buy a sports car so we're really trying to classify people and there are several classification techniques that we'll study in this course okay so it is possible that for a given problem one classification technique might work better than another technique and therefore what you might do when you're faced with such a problem is to try several techniques and pick the one that seems to work best okay so we might build a model but then of course we are concerned about how do we know how good our model is because after all the test of the model is going to come in terms of how well it does in future cases because with the cases that we have in front of us we already know the value of the target variable it's only for future cases where we don't know the value of the target variable and therefore it might look as if the quality of the model is actually going to be determined only in the future when we actually try and use it can we do better than that okay we can in fact do better than that because in traditional statistics we have, we are forced to draw inferences based on a limited amount of data that's because you know statistics was uh, developed uh, in the 1920s 30s and so on that is when it started being developed and uh, therefore those days collecting data was not all that easy it was a very expensive process time consuming process okay and in fact even analyzing data was difficult because a lot of things had to be done manually at best they had mechanical calculators available and therefore all of statistical theory a lot of statistical theory was actually developed assuming that there's a paucity of data how best do you draw inferences from a limited amount of data now it's a testimony to uh, the great minds who worked on statistics that many of those techniques are still relevant and useful even today when we have so much of data available but the main challenge for them was how to draw inferences based on limited amount of data and once you have done that they had to do all kinds of mathematical and probabilistic arguments to prove that the model that they built on such a limited amount of data is actually valid for the larger population right so they had to use probabilistic analyses and so on to prove the quality of their model sometimes these analyses worked well sometimes you know if you if you're dealing with a very large population and you're working with a small amount of data there's only so much you can do you can't give a great guarantee as to the quality of your model that is what traditional statistics was all about now when you're talking about data mining the situation is completely different you have lots and lots of data available for you and establishing the model quality is therefore as we'll shortly see much easier in data mining provided we have lots of data as we said earlier we've got a lot of data there's no positive data in this diagram we are only showing you a small subset of the data that we have available given that we have a lot of data what we do in data mining often is to partition the data this process that we are now going to look at is called supervised learning so what we try and do is to partition the data into a training partition and as we'll shortly see a validation partition so what we're trying to say is we've got a lot of data we don't need all of this data for actually building our model which is to learn the underlying patterns so we'll use a part of the data to learn the underlying patterns and we'll reserve the rest of the data to validate what we have built to validate the model that we have built right so what we are going to do is to take the data split it up into two parts the training partition and the validation partition so the validation partition we will not use in our model build, model building effort at all we'll use only the training partition to build our model so in some sense the validation partition is an unbiased set of data that we have not really looked at at all 
to build the model. So what we'll try and do is to build our model based on the training partition. And of course, as we've already said, there are several different types of models that we'll be looking at in the course. Whatever it is, we'll build our model using the training partition. And of course, in both the training partition and the validation partition, because it's historical data, the target variables values are all available anyway. So in this example, to make things concrete, you've got the household income, you've got the education, you've got a lot of other characteristics perhaps for each case. And for every single case, you know whether they bought a sports car or not, whether they are owners or not owners. We've got that information. So we'll in the training partition, we'll use all of that information to learn the underlying patterns, to identify the characteristics of those people who are likely to buy a sports car. Then we'll use the validation partition to validate our model. So we've built a model. We can then go to the validation partition, try to see for every case what our model predicts, compare that with the reality, because the validation partition is after all historical data. So we also know the reality of whether each of those cases is an owner or not. So for every case, we first use our model to predict the ownership or not owner, non-ownership. And then we compare that with what is reality. So then we get an idea of how good the model was. That's the whole idea of supervised learning. An analogy might help you to understand this better. When we are trying to learn something, what? how do we learn? We are given lots of examples to learn. Right? So let's say you're trying to learn trigonometry or, or geometry. First, what do we do? We learn the concepts. Then we see a lot of solved problems for which they give us the problem, they also give us the solution. So we learn, we go through several of these solved problems, we learn the concepts, underlying concepts, and then what do we do to test whether we've really understood the concepts or not? We solve the assignment problems. So we do the assignment problems, and then we can compare our results with, let's say the results available for the assignments at the end of the book, or alternately, you, you solve the assignments and then the instructor grades your assignments and tells you whether you did right or not. And so you now have an idea of how well you've learned. So the assignment problems are like the validation partition and the solved problems that we use to study are like the training partition, okay? So you learn the concepts, underlying patterns and so on from the training partition. And then once you think you've built a model that looks reasonable, then you see, okay, really how reasonable was the model that we built? How good is the model? You, you know, let it cut its chops on the actual validation partition. So you do the prediction or the classification and then see how good it was because we have the real data as well. This approach is what is called a supervised learning where you learn first from uh, information that is already available and then apply that to the validation partition where the information is available, but you predict without using that information and then compare that with the actual information that's available.